So how many people have heard of differential privacy? Anyone? It's coming up in the data news lately if you happen to have a differential privacy Google alert like I do. But uh, <laughs> uh, I'll start off with me. Uh, I started off doing uh, radar systems, making maps, which is a lot of math, not much privacy at all. Um, then I went here where you'd, you'd be surprised there's actually a lot of privacy there. Um, <laughs> once they have the data, they don't like people abusing it too much. Um, so uh, actually while I was there, I came up with this, uh, or hobbies are terrorism, and then I kind of dropped the mic and left. Um, <laughs> but actually, uh, to uh, combat their, their privacy, and they, they have a lot of data access issues and a lot of reporting requirements and stuff, so we, we wrote this database called Accumulo. It's very much H-base with uh, cell level security built in. Um, so, so that's one aspect of, of privacy is you kind of like build a giant database, all your data will come here, but most, most enterprises won't do that. Like, you know, the NSA was able to do it, but they had a four-star general saying, you're gonna do it and I'm not paying for your Oracle licenses anymore. So uh, that's how they got away with it. Uh, but so a group of us left and formed a company called Immuta, um, and we kind of took a lot of lessons learned about data access and privacy and it's not, it's not super sexy machine learning startup, but uh, it's a lot of compliance and governance and stuff like that. Um, yeah, pe people still need it, and data scientists need it too. Um, <laughs> yeah, so hey, that's my uh, next slide. So yeah, the GD why, why are we talking about this stuff? The GDPR is coming. This is a snapshot from their website. Uh, according to them, it's the most important change in data privacy regulation. And they have this little doomsday counter on their website. And it sits there and you can watch it until, you know, I assume most lawyers just watch this. And then when it hits zero, they release the lawsuits and we'll make money. So it's kind of your job to make sure you're not the uh, focus of that lawsuit, I think, as a data scientist. So first thing we can do, we can just kill all the lawyers. And Shakespeare had a good idea there. But really, we can just math our way around this problem. So uh, I'm going to talk about three scenarios, uh, releasing data, collecting data, and then interacting with data uh, privately. So releasing data, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the punchline up front. It's not a good idea. <laughs> uh, but there's a technique called k-anonymization, where you produce a release of data, uh, just post it out there on the internet, and, you, and you've uh, anonymized it, though, so that you have guarantees uh, that the individuals can't be re-identified. Um, and, and that sounds good, but it's actually very difficult to achieve. Um, here's a chart out of the initial k-anonymization paper. And really the concept is to generalize your data enough such that no matter how you group by, uh, you know, race, birth, gender, or zip code, um, the problems are going to be, uh, have diversity in them. So you won't be able to... Uh, for instance, if you, if you grouped by, by this and you had this, this group of, uh, of white people born in 64 males, uh, if I knew you were one of those people, I would not know if you had chest pain, obesity, or shortness of breath, right? So you're kind of your privacy is protected that way. Um, but even in this chart, there's actually a canonymization error here. Um, you know, you have two people in this group, but they both have the same problem. Right, so, yeah, I don't know which one you are, but it doesn't matter because I still know what your problem is. Um, so this led to uh, what's called L diversity, so that's making sure your K groups have enough diversity in them. And then, you know, a paper came out saying, actually, that's not good enough. You have to make sure that the diversity in those groups actually has a statistical, statistically relevant distribution, uh, you know, you know, relevant to the, to the overall population, so that's even harder to try and maintain for every possible grouping. You know, as you add columns, this becomes a, a nightmare to try and actually do. And then it doesn't guard against the release of future information either. So if someone else releases more data later, they can link it to this data and uh, violate your, your, your privacy. Um, so yeah, there's many, many attack vectors and there's papers all over the place. Um, so to drive that point home, uh, AOL, do you guys, this was a while ago, they released search terms. 
of uh, 650,000 users, three months of search terms, and they anonymized it. They said it was fine. And researchers then went through and said, hey, that's great, thanks for the research data. But other ones said, all right, let's identify somebody. And they did. Uh, they found user 4417749, Thelma Arnold. She's a widow with numb fingers and a dog that urinates on everything. And even this picture they found of her has a dog wearing a diaper, <laughs> confirming that the dog urinates on everything. And this was ranked by CNN as the 57th dumbest moment in business, $500 million lawsuit. Uh, anyone's name with a C in front of it was like fired. They didn't have a chief data scientist because that wasn't a thing at the time, but I'm sure the, the, they would have fired him too. Uh, so uh, at any rate, they, uh, yeah, basically don't do it. And this is kind of what, you know, the looming GDPR might be leading to is a bunch of these lawsuits. So how can we get around this? Uh, one way is randomized response, and that's a technique uh, Google and Apple are promoting lately. Um, so, so what is this? This is a way to collect sensitive data in a private manner. So if you had the privacy when you collect, you can kind of do what you want with it because it's built into the data you have. So uh, you, have these, you have these cards over here, right? So uh, I usually try to come up with a sensitive question to ask and we'll survey everyone, but this, these cards uh, gave me a good opportunity for privacy. So like I'm a big guy and I'm gonna be staring at whoever puts a red card over there, right? And <laughs> so you might not want to, you know, give me a red card because you know I'm watching you and I'm gonna see you at the happy hour and I'm gonna get a couple of drinks in me and we're gonna have words, <laughs> right? So <clears throat> you might not want to do that. So instead of everyone just doing what they really think, what we can do is like everyone roll an imaginary die. And if, you know, you rolled a three, or if you, you know, pick a number between one and six, if you pick a three, what you do is you grab a red card and you throw it in regardless of what you thought of me. That way, everyone that threw a red card in there has this plausible deniability when I corner you later, you could be like, no, I was part of the random thing. And I'll be like, hey, everyone I'm cornering says they're part of the random thing, but there's no, no way for me to get around that, right? So, yeah, it's this plausible deniability that, yeah, that you then maintain. Um, this isn't the right formula for three cards and all these people. This is like for, you know, yes or no. But, you know, you can do the math that there's this extra noise in your data. And as long as you have enough people and enough samples, you can back out the, and, and get at what the true proportion is. Um, so this is what... Uh, Google has, has uh, published that they're doing, they have this paper called Rapport, the Randomized Aggregatable Privacy Preserving Ordinal Response. So what that is, is they take your settings in your Chrome browser and they add noise to what your actual settings are before they uh, send them to Google when you have a Chrome crash. And that protects you in, I don't know, however much you value what your settings are in your Chrome browser. Um, but so they don't know what your true, you know, settings are. But they have so many users that even though they're randomly flipping settings, they can beat those against each other and find out what the true settings were, you know, probably during this crash. So you get enough crash reports, you get enough settings with noise, uh, beat it out and, and, and get at your real data. So that, that technique has been shown to be differentially private. And that's kind of the, the, the gist of this talk here. So differential privacy, what is it? It formalizes the idea that a private computation should not re reveal whether any one person participated in the input, much less what their data was, right? So it's a concept where I don't actually care if I have your data or not, the way I'm doing things, I shouldn't care. I do need some data, so I do need your data, but uh, if you were to take your particular data uh, away from me, my analysis wouldn't change. Um, and this is a quote from Frank McSherry, who's actually your keynote speaker in this session tomorrow, right? And uh, he's great, you should come listen to him. Like, whatever he says is probably gonna be funny and entertaining, and uh, he's not talking about differential privacy, but he's kind of one of the original authors of, of the concept. So, um, 
yeah, any hard questions you have for me, ask Frank tomorrow. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, so what is differential privacy? So uh, the formal definition is you have these two data sets that vary by one entry, you know, data, data one and data two, you have this, this single entry here, and you want to perform some aggregation across that data, a query uh, of that data. And here's the formal definition. So you have the probability that that query on data set one uh, just is, differs by uh, the, the result of that query on data set two by this e to the epsilon factor. So that's kind of kind of a weird formula to get a, get your, get a hold of, and it doesn't really tell you how to do queries or how to, how to do anything with this epsilon. So uh, let's get into that. Uh, yeah, can we have that in words? So what this is doing is, is treating privacy for usability. And that e to the epsilon is generally uh, an addition of some random noise to the query results. So uh, this, this m factor here forces you to only have aggregate queries. So there's no select star limit, one million, put it on my laptop and let's have fun. That doesn't exist in this world. Um, but that's fine. Um, <coughs> What, what this does do though, it protects against all past, current, and future data releases. And you're gonna get statistically the same result regardless of any single entry in the database or not in that database. So, uh, and if you ask the right questions, you're gonna get the right result even though it's gonna have noise, but you know, congratulations, like if you're, you're data scientists, your, your data is already like some noisy sample of some infinite reality we have here anyway. So what's a little bit more noise because your data, even though we're, this is the data engineering conference and I'm sure there's great data engineers here, all, all data just kind of sucks and it's noisy, right? <laughs> so <clears throat> that's why we have jobs. So, <laughs> so uh, differential privacy, basically you come up with a way to add noise and then you go through mathematically and prove that that way is differentially private and hopefully it's useful too. So one such method is, is this Laplacian method, and it's the, it's the, the widest used method. And basically, you, you take your query result, you take a random draw from this uh, Laplacian distribution, and you add it to your result. Uh, the Laplacian has this one factor here, and we set it to this delta m over epsilon. So epsilon is your privacy parameter. That's how much variability you want in your query. Um, Chosen by you, up for debate what it should be, somewhere around one-ish. Um, if it's 10, you're gonna kinda kill this to nothing. Um, and delta M, so what's this delta M is your sensitivity of your, of your query and your data. So uh, in, in um, <coughs> excuse me, in, uh, yeah, in basic terms, sensitivity is kind of the, the maximum of, of the difference of any query on that one data set and any query on that other data set. And uh, the, the easy example here is, is like the housing market. If you have a bunch of houses on your block, except for the one guy at the top of the street has this mansion, and you want to protect the... Uh, uh, the, the individual values of the homes on this block, but we want to, you know, be able to summarize this block somehow uh, privately. So uh, what you do is if you, if you look at the, the mean of this, uh, it's not very sensitive because if you throw any one of these houses out of the mean calculation, or more likely if you throw this $30 million house out of the mean calculation, it's going to... Um, change the mean widely. So you have to adjust your noise to that huge $30 million swing. So to properly do that, you would uh, have to return the answer of basically 30 million plus noise all the time, no matter what question was asked, because you're asking for the mean. So the, the median is a much, a much better question to ask of this data set, because no matter what house you throw out, the median house is only going to vary by about you know ten thousand dollars or so. So since that variability is only ten thousand, you have to add noise proportionally to that variability. So you're going to get uh, a better result and still protect the privacy of the thirty million without saturating any usefulness with noise. So all right, 
aggregate statistics. I know, like that gave me heartburn at first too. I can only do aggregations. Um, but a uh, paper was just released of people working on differential privacy uh, in conjunction with Uber. And they, they did a giant survey around Uber of all their queries. And they found that, can you read it up there? Yeah. 34% uh, were these statistical aggregate queries, right? And the rest of them were these raw data select queries. And I have zero evidence for this, but I assume that's like data engineers being lazy and just doing select stars for their ETL out of this database that people are actually trying to do real statistics on, and they should, <laughs> they should do that ETL somewhere else anyway. But uh, that's just my conjecture to make my uh, opinion of statistical queries look better. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, 8 million queries, and uh, it, it's actually kind of kind of cool data that they that they published. So how, how's another method of just randomly doing this query and adding this noise? How can we control that noise a little bit better? And um, this is kind of what, what we've worked on. Um, it's a paper that I don't have referenced here, but I, I can send that out. It's, uh, it's called the sample and aggregate method. So what you do is you have a lot of data and you break it into samples and you run that query on each sample independently. And then you look at the results of those independent queries and you aggregate them together and add noise in a private way. And what that does is if you're, if you're able to break your query up and look for averages and, and if the average is always you know, the same or something or the counts are very similar among all those groups, then that query is not very sensitive kind of by definition. Like, you asked it independently to a bunch of different people and you always got the same answer, well then I can just release that same answer. If you remove any piece of data from any one of those samples and I'm still gonna get the same answer, I can you know, accurately release that data. Um, and then, it, you know, likewise, if it's, if it's not, you, you can get a measurement of how much noise you have to add. So what this is doing is instead of uh, looking at the query itself, whether it's the mean or the median or a count, you know, a count has a sensitivity of one. And uh, what you can do is focus it on the data you actually have. So it's kind of flipping the script a little bit to the data rather than, than the query itself. But there's other things you can do with differential privacy. So, so it is more useful too. So this is the Gini co coefficient. It, it measures this type of imbalance, typically in payroll data. Um, or wealth, the top 1%, if you will. And, um, you know, here, here's a, a definition of this curve from Wikipedia, but if everyone made the same amount of money, you'd have this nice curve here. It's this cumul cumulative share of people from low to high, and then um, the share of their income earned uh, for that population. Um, so we actually did this uh, using our differential privacy data source and you know, broke up the salaries into small groups and were able to match the, the private versus unprivate pretty closely. So we know that there is this imbalance in our payroll data and we haven't you know, found out who's the cause of it. We just kind of know the degree of it. Um, so yeah, you kind of have to, have to do higher level, higher order statistics, lots of aggregates and stuff, but there's still a lot of statistics out there you can do with differential privacy. Um, we've tried to make the tool, and this is where we're working on it, like sometimes it, there's a fine line between telling you no, that was too specific, and telling you, and just giving you a crazy number back, right? Hopefully you're going to recognize that it's a crazy number you get back uh, when we do that, but, but that's still uh, an area we're working on. Um, right, yeah, but we're in this world of machine learning. Have you guys seen this comic yet? Um, SKCD. You know, this is your machine learning system. Yeah, you just shove data in to this linear algebra, and if it looks wrong, you just kind of stir up the algebra until it looks right. And, you know, clearly we're doing image recognition. This convoluted mess must be private. Um, but I have bad news for you. It's not. So machine learning is vul vulnerable to uh, privacy attacks, too. Um, one is this model inversion attack. Um, where they're really uh, able to extract your model parameters and your training data 
out of your out of your model itself by you know basically running other neural nets against your network, right? And what they're able to do is extract this generic face as the model from this this face recognition system they attacked. And um, yeah, it's kind of blurry, but you can kind of see a face in there. And then sure enough, this is one of the faces that was in the training data set. So um, yeah, so machine learning has been shown to be to be uh, you know be able to violate uh, privacy in those situations too. Um, an another machine learning differentially private system is similar to the sample and aggregate, but kind of on a higher order machine level, machine learning level. Um, what they did was, uh, this is Nicholas Paperno from Penn State did this. Um, and what they did was basically they, they took all this data and they, they formed a bunch of neural networks, trained a bunch of them uh, in parallel and, at, and separated the data. So these aren't seeing any of the same data sets. Uh, and then you have this aggregate teacher. Um, and in teaching this teacher, what they're doing is they, they injected noise here, um, kind of this e to the epsilon noise in this process. And uh, you know, then the then the teacher can be queried, and it's and it's been shown to be private. Um, so that's kind of cool. But you need then like 10x the data and 10x the training of the models, and it's a big 10x problem. But but you get privacy as the result. Uh, so here's his experimental result: uh, the non-private versus the private on the MNIST data set and the uh, Street View uh, signs. Uh, some of it wasn't wasn't awesome, but here's the the golden boy uh, result. Here is this on the UCI diabetes data set. They were actually able to to get slightly better results with this uh, 1.4 times uh, 1.44 epsilon uh, privacy parameter. So, and they they surmise that the addition of the noise is actually you know, killing your overfitting and your, you know, the memorization that these things tend to do. So maybe it's not such a bad idea to just like inject noise into this process. Uh, and I hope I see more, more papers where people are doing that to uh, maintain privacy. Um, so yeah, summary is laws are catching up to your data science, um, but we can do better math, we can make better models, we can add noise. Um, generally, I, uh, I don't know, when I, when I talk to data scientists, they don't really care about the individuals in their data sets. Um, the, the data scientists at the NSA definitely cared about the individuals in the data sets. But, um, but in general, you know, you're just looking at click patterns and you just want to know, you know, who I am and how I can click on something, not who I am specifically, you know, like what, what drives me to click. So, uh, yeah, I think that's all I got. Uh, here's my contact info. I'll be at the thing. I yeah, finished a little fast, half an hour. So does people have questions? We can do questions. Yeah, yeah let's thank Jim real quick. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, some questions from the audience? Um, so what if you happen to work with a lot of data that is intended for CRM or customer relations marketing or management, depending on how you want to view the M part, um, where it is I mean, you can do a lot of analysis, but specifically you're, you're asking these people to give you their data. Um, you can fuse it statistically to a lot of other data sets. Um, and obviously we have a lot of lawyers working on making sure that that's all cool, but I care a lot about privacy and I would like to be able to apply these principles to customer relation marketing data so that we're not annoying the shit out of people. <laughs> So, so you're looking, if I understand, you're looking to, like, on the collection aspect, I, I think is where a lot of that is going to happen. On the analysis that we're doing. So, uh, on so, the analysis. So, so, I, so, like, if we're going to do a machine learning model to say, like, hey, you really like concerts with th whatever terrible pop artist, we need to remarket to you, how, how right. should we be thinking about anonymizing that and, and protecting those right. people's information while still utilizing it as as a company for our benefit right it's it, I, yeah it's a tough balance right so that's what differential privacy does is it is it trades that usability is what you would call it for privacy so uh, 
to break it to you, you're going to have to give up some usability. But maybe not. So if you can come up with statistics that are aggregations and uh, break those, the, the data you have into big enough groups that you can do meaningful aggregations and then train models kind of on higher order statistics that were developed differentially private that have noise generated on them. Or, or you know, towards the end is, is doing a differentially private machine learning model in and of, in and of itself, you know, to be able to class a, a private classifier. So it's going to be like kind of new techniques that have noise injected into the training process. Uh, would, would definitely do it. The other thing is, is the, sorry, just to combine techniques. I mean, differential privacy is kind of like the hammer that throws away usability, but you can do uh, anonymization techniques. I mean, they are good, they're just not perfectly private. And since it's internal, like, you know, that kind of helps. Like, you know, I wouldn't say post that on your GitHub as, hey, help us analyze this in the next Kaggle thing, because people are going to de-anonymize it. Trust is like Obviously, as a company, they're probably going to turn around and give it to advertisers. Uh, like, obviously, they're probably going to turn it around and give it to advertisers. Um, where I've worked and I know what advertisers do with data as well. So it's kind of how do I, as a data scientist, make sure, and data engineer, make sure that I'm protecting the data that we're collecting from what the people in marketing are going to do with it. Right. Well, <laughs> so if you can do it on the collection side, that, that would be good, too is to add noise to the collection process, then you as a data scientist have to beat that noise out on the back end. So then it never exists at the company, right? Unprivate. So that's it. Uh, well, my question was on the actual collection portion of it. I mean, you mentioned mm -hmm. these techniques would be used for at an aggregate level, uh, but is there any noise that we could add to, you know, for CRM, we probably can't because we have to service the customer. But is there anything we could do on the storage of these customer records? You know, you mentioned GDPR and other things, but at a, at a, at a granular, like, record level. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, adding noise during the collection process is really, I think, what Google and Apple are trying to do to combat the GDPR. It's like, I actually don't have your data. I have some, you have your data and noise. I can't identify you from it. Um, that, does that answer? You can't do that for like BII and other things like addresses. You could add things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, they, you can't add it to the, the like addresses and zip codes. We can't like add noise to them because we have to service them later. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, I mean, you would have to you know bubble up addresses to the block or the city or something like that. You know, then do, using do generalization techniques to, uh, to, to, to bubble it up. And then you can look at those, the K anonymization work to figure out how much you have to bubble it up such that when you get down to things, how, mu how much is left over and, and identifiable when you're done. But that is, that is some work to prove that to yourself. I really don't know if many companies are going to like care until this law hits them and you're able to show you know, a, a definite company loss because of it. I've spent a lot of time working with data, and data has meaning because of the context that it's in. Yeah. So a piece of private data is private because there's a context which identifies a specific person or thing based on that data. The um, anonymization of data assumes that you can bound the context in a meaningful way, and I think right. big data is antithetical to that, that ultimately, regardless of how much effort you put into anonymizing your data, if there's any meaning in that data, eventually somebody's going to be able to discover and exploit it. Right. Yeah, that, that's true. And that's why, like, that K-anonymization just doesn't work. Like, eventually, there's going to be other data that's going to reveal, you know, the, the, the problem in your, in your privacy uh, uh, attempt.